Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kier, routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf online at sunburymotors.com. Ford, Lincoln, Kia, Hyundai. Great new inventory. Best. Fabulous pre-owned inventory, all with the Sunbury Motors guarantee. It's all at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia, routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf. Online at sunburymotors.com. Doug Birdsong made a great point. The Ivy League won't let their champion go to the FCS playoff, but they'll let their basketball champion go to the NCAA tournament. And as Doug points out, could it be that you don't get any money for the FCS playoff? Hmm. Huh. Harvard has a $40 billion endowment, so we all do know that they are very good at counting money. <laughs> They're very good at it. Oh, my almighty! <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. All right. Our play-by-play call of the day. Travis Shaw wins it for the Red Sox with a grand slam. Here's the 2-1. Oh, that's not it. Swung on and line <laughs> down the left field line. There is a base hit going to the left field wall. One run scores LeMayhew. And... The other run scores Gallo. It's a two-run double off the bat of Stanton. And the Yankees take a 3-1 lead. <laughs> yeah, we're going with the team that's won 10 in a row. Yeah, Grand Slam's kind of the ultimate walk-off. Um, yeah, John Sterling making the call while sitting in New York and not Atlanta. And you can tell, too. Like, oh, yeah, Gallo's going to score. It's like, and that's not John's fault, but yeah, it's going to be kind of baseball's again not helping itself. You know what? If they're vaccinated, let them go. Let them go. Don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. They're hurting their product by doing it this way. Oh, well. It's my opinion. I think what is it up to at least a dozen to 15 now are traveling? But not everybody is. And New York's not. In fact, they're debating whether to let the Yankee broadcasters go over to City Field and do the game with the Mets. What? What? I'm baffled by this. But, all right. Let's talk about the Steelers. Pat Frymuth had a big game. With that, we bring in Neil Coulon, sir. Welcome back. Great to have you with us. Well, as always, it's great to be here. I hope that uh, I hope that I know enough to get me through the day. That's about it. Exactly, and that's exactly what our goal is here. Uh, so let's get to uh, <laughs> let's get to the game on Saturday night. Uh, ben got his couple series in, uh, and the two touchdown passes went to Pat Fryermuth. Neither happened to be an easy catch. Uh, are we seeing a quarterback showing some confidence? In his young tight end, on I, on plays like that, I'll say this: Ben put both of those in in the spot that is most most able to be caught by his guy and He's, nobody else. They exactly. were those were textbook throws, and he put them on like fifty mile an hour rope. I mean, they they were bullets. Um, Frymouth looked like he belonged on both of those throws. The routes that he ran, um, it, it looked like they had run that. You know, a hundred times before, I, I was impressed with that. It, it's it's uh, it's shaping into a nice hookup, a nice connection, and um, the the value of it is as much as we enjoy dogging Eric Ebron, uh, you can put the two of them on opposite sides of the line in those kinds of situations and create uh, mismatch problems. And that that's something I think that was completely missing from the Steelers' uh, short yardage and red zone offense last year. Um, they, clearly, they didn't have a second tight end. I mean, I've, I've talked about this before. I've, I've always appreciated 
um, Vance McDonald's workmanlike manner, you know, mm-hmm. the way that he, he went about his, his job. But he was working on like half a body last year. I mean, he just was not the same guy uh, that we had seen before. And Ebron it probably isn't enough to handle all of that on his own. They're, they're keying on him. He's the guy that they're looking to, to get the ball to. And they weren't able to exploit any uh, one-on-one situations, it seemed like anyway, uh, in, in a lot of the red zone. A couple in the fact that they can't run the ball. Some of that has to do with Ebron and his you know, lack of ability in that regard. Um, I, you know, I, I talked all off season the fact that one way or another, through hook or crook, the Steelers were going to need to find a second tight end. I don't care where it was or how they did it. Um, Fryermuth, to me, and I, you know, I'm, I'm on the record as saying very much like Mike, like what Mike Tomlin said. Um, great, can you block? I mean, it really, that that's more of where I think his his uh, his ground zero begins. Mm-hmm. But from what we've seen of him, if it is cap- if he is capable of starting with a, a specialty role that he can do at a high level, he's going to have a real nice year. And building on that, he can have a great career. That that I think is really kind of the ceiling that he had. Uh, the team's going to need to be able to block well, but getting them down to the red zone in the manner that, that Ben did, and frankly, he should have um, it, on on all three possessions that he was out there. Uh, keep in mind, incidentally, a, a, an Ebron drop on third down um, got him off the field the, the first three plays that he had. Uh, you, you put all of that together, uh, if they can move the ball the way that they did against, you know, to be fair, a pretty hapless Lions team, mm-hmm. uh, I think they can compete. And it, that's that's a good thing. And I think Frymouth is definitely going to be um, a, 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 a part of that uh, in specialty situations. And those are the downs that the Steelers lost consistently last year. And I think it's exactly what they were trying to address with their first three draft picks, with Farmer being the second of the three. Yeah. Put all three of those together, uh, they can win situational football on offense. And I, I don't think they would have had the the, um, the, the demise that they did uh, over the last, what, five, six games uh, if they were able to win more of those downs consistently throughout the year. What do you think of Joe Schobert? Um, I don't think we saw enough of him to really uh, to, to really render much of a uh, of a of a decision on him. Um, I like him as a player. I like what I have seen of him in the past. He's right. he's to use this phrase again. He's a workman like guy. You know, he gets out there, um, plays the game on three downs the way that it should be played. He's he's uh, uh, he's better in coverage, I think, than than people would not would think that he is, considering how many tackles he he had when he was in Cleveland. Um, you bring him over to Jacksonville, perhaps not the right contract to have signed him for, uh, for a, a coaching staff and a front office that isn't there anymore. Um, nobody in Jacksonville had a good year last year, let's be honest. It right. doesn't look like they're going to have all that great of a year this year either. But um, right. it just ended up being the wrong fit. The Steelers can benefit from that because I think, anyway, Schobert gives them probably more coverage dimension than they would have had uh, had Bush – been if he stayed healthy last year, if he did not have a, a, a torn ACL to recover from, uh, perhaps he's at a high level uh, coming into this camp. To me, honestly, Steve, it doesn't look like he is. I, I don't like the way that he looks. Right. Uh, he's not there yet. It's going to take a little bit yet. And I think Schobert helps raise that floor a little bit. It gives them uh, probably their dime linebacker. I think you take Bush off of that. Um, just I don't think he's there coverage-wise. I think Schobert can do that, though. And they can remain versatile on defense, which they're really going to need to be. Uh, in today's NFL, if you're not a versatile defense, you're not a good defense. So right. it, Schobert gives them that depth um, to, to be able to go deeper into sub packages and uh, be, a, be a more versatile, more well-rounded defense. Uh, one more coming up on Friday night, which will be for the Steelers, their fourth. Is there a veteran, and I don't mean a starter. I mean, it doesn't have to be a starter. Is there a veteran that should be on notice that needs to show value on Friday night? I don't think so, but um, it cuts come out here, and, and the Steelers will probably release theirs at exactly 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm sure they've notified whoever they're going to. I'm, I'm curious to see if there is a the move there, right. simply because I think this would be, if, if they respected a veteran player, this is the cut that they'd make for them. Right. Um, to give them a chance to, a give them, that, to give them a chance to hook on with somebody else. Yeah. Exactly, and there, there's not, you know, they they might get. Uh, a couple reps with somebody in that final preseason game, that that final tune-up. This is the one they would cut now. Um, I, I'd want to see that first, but 
I don't know. I mean, with, with the fact that Antoine Brooks uh, hasn't been healthy after a real good start to him in camp and in preseason, I thought Brooks might have bumped uh, Arthur Millette off the roster. But uh, Millette, even though he's injured now as well, I'm not sure you can get rid of him um, just considering what he's done to this point, And I'm not sure if he's just not the – the first of many nickelbacks it sounds like the Steelers are going to have <laughs> um, based on what Tomlin has said he might just have to be that by default while Brooks you know, kind of gets caught back up, uh, gets healthy again otherwise no, I, I don't know I, I wouldn't think that any of them would um, you know, he might cut Josh Dobbs free but uh, I don't feel that they necessarily have to do that today either um, I, I don't know, I, I think their team was pretty you had a pretty good idea of it coming into uh, training camp, who they were going to be. Um, they had, I think, positional battles more so than roster battles. Um, I don't think there'd be a veteran that they'd need to get rid of cap-wise. Um, I would have thought if there was a battle in that regard, it would have been between uh, Joe Hayden and the, the, the former Steelers, Stephen Nelson, but they took care of that back in March. So um, I don't think so. Um, maybe if you want to call it this, I mean, Jalen Samuels, um, probably a guy that's on the bubble i don't see him making the team um i'm not sure what happened with benny snell maybe maybe somebody else knows but he hasn't participated in seemingly anything so uh you can't put him on the team so i think between samuel and balage um the, the, one of those two is your third back i think that's probably balage and we'll see a good amount of Jalen samuels on uh friday if mm-hmm. if they decide to keep him um but i could see them cutting him loose now as well uh, i don't know i, I think uh it, it, it wouldn't be a surprise if I can tell you what it is today. Um, I just I don't anticipate any of that happening. The reception from Mason Rudolph when he came into the game was not exactly kind on, on the home field. Uh, yeah, you know, in terms of him coming into the game, uh, I mean, I, Mike Tomlin doesn't think about such things. But I was just surprised that that he was received that way when he ran just running onto the field. I mean, Ben played his two series, he was done, and he was the next guy up. Yeah, I, I think, one, it was fun to see Ben, the way that he was playing. I think there, there might have been some, oh, keep Ben in there, come on, I paid money for this, and I, I want to see the, the Steelers put up 80 on the line. Right, right, I think yeah, they could have, but right. they, kept, yeah. they kept their feet on the gas. Um, there, there is some consternation as far as Rudolph goes. Uh, there, there's certainly a contingent of fans that feels uh, Dwayne Haskins should be the backup. Um, I I think it's pretty obvious. You know, if if you look at it objectively, and I, I'm not gathering that many fans are able to do that when it comes to the Steelers' back quarterback, but I I don't think Rudolph would have fairly been cast as a, a, an equal partner in the competition for the second string quarterback of the team this year. Bringing Haskins in off the street, uh, not having had him in a camp before. Um, and then to say that he's on equal footing with Rudolph, I think, is, is silly. It's just not what you do. They don't know exactly what they have with Haskins in a, an actual game situation. They have plenty of that with Rudolph. And the reality is, if you look at the two of them in terms of their career arc, they're almost equal. Right. I mean, it's scary how close they are as far as how they've performed. If that's the case, why would you go with the devil you don't know over the devil you do? They, right. you, yeah. you wouldn't do that in that situation. People just like the, the, the flash, I think, of um, the, the new guy coming in. Haskins has a great arm. It's fun to watch him you know, just sit back and, and sling it. But Rudolph availed himself well. I thought he looked like the, you know, he looked the part. Um, for me, I would have thought, and that this seems to be the direction the Steelers are going to go, uh, Rudolph would have had to lose the job. And there's no right. way anybody objectively could say that Rudolph lost the job. Right. He performed pretty well. And usually the, the counter to uh, Haskins' ascension into this position is based on Rudolph not finishing off drives with the twos and the threes in the second, third, fourth quarter of a preseason game. It, we're, we're being a little too literal with the results of preseason. Um, obviously, you want to score. <laughs> I thought right. Rudolph put up a good ball to, to Juju in the corner. I thought yeah. Juju made a, a good competitive effort to come mm-hmm. up with that. The defender knocked it away. Um, th- things come into it. But Rudolph led the team well. I thought he threw with confidence. Uh, for the most part, I mean, he protected the ball. I, I, I don't think he had an interception. Yeah, I know they had the fumble on the, the handoff uh, with Chase Pool, with, <laughs> with Claypool on the first uh, – series of the preseason, but Rudolph didn't do anything to, to suggest to anybody that he's a bad option, that there is somebody available who's better than him right now to step in. I, I, you know, Rudolph is the guy that they're going with, but once again, 
what matters here is the team is ride or die with them as it should be. Um, Rudolph shouldn't matter this season. Haskins shouldn't matter this season. If they do, other things have gone wrong, and the situation probably isn't going to be fixed by either one of them. So, you know, just kind of take that for what it is. We know how Bill Belichick operates. Uh, Bill Belichick um, is somebody that takes a long, hard look at somebody, even if they've been with him for, let's just say he's been with him for seven or eight years. And he's looking around saying, you know what, I know he's going to be great one more year, but boy, I see the possibility that when he gets to the year after that, it's going to be a fall off. So he gets rid of them or decides to move on. Not getting rid of them is kind of cold, but he moves on to somebody else before he gets to that bad year. How is Mike Tomlin in that? Is Mike Tomlin in some ways that way, or is he loyal to a fault? What is Mike Tomlin? I think to, to address that, we can't just look at Tomlin. Part of it is Colbert as well. Okay. Um, I would say this. The Steelers, I believe, and I don't have the stat in front of me to, to show it, but they pay out more money on their extensions than any other team does. And what that means is when they sign a guy to a five-year contract, he stays for five years. Uh, there are exceptions to that. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, by and large, though, that's what they've done. And a, a lot of the times, even if it's not uh, that guy, um, even if it's not the, the primary guy that they signed, if they have a backup that comes in to take his job, you kind of understand where that comes from. Um, it's still a business in the end. But for the most part, they stick with their veterans. And we've seen the good side of it. We've seen the bad side of it. Cam Hayward is a good example of a guy that they weren't going to let go they signed to another extension. They're paying him pretty much market um, for, for the production that he's giving. And it's still great. But uh, if Cam drops off, he's probably still going to play through that contract. Okay. Now, that doesn't happen to everybody. Um, Troy Polamalu being an exception, mm-hmm. uh, you can understand uh, they're, they're always going to be one or two. But what you have to understand, too, is when they sign a, a guy to a five-year contract, if they cut him, it's after four years. It's not after three. There are a lot of teams that do it after three um, Le'Veon Bell did not believe in that. He didn't trust that the Steelers were going to do that. And what happened to Le'Veon Bell, he got cut after really two years of, mm-hmm. of, his, of his contract. Now, he got the, the money that he had agreed to sign on for, but the Steelers would have kept him for four. I just think, you know, we, we know that through uh, their, their track record. Um, the idea here, obviously, in an ideal situation is to not have the guy signed at a point where – he did drop off, and he is ready to go. You can kind of just walk away and, and move on. Um, Alejandro Villanueva, I think we're going to see as an example of that. Um, probably not Mike Hilton so much, but that's right. another guy that they let walk because they, they felt they have uh, better players behind him at, for the dollar. Um, there are examples on both sides of the aisle. I, I think overall the Steelers probably excel in that in some areas and have had issues with it in others. Um, David DeCastro, I don't know how I forgot about him. Uh, right. He's a guy they, they cut uh, pretty quick after finding out mm-hmm. he wasn't going to be ready to go. Uh, yep. Definitely the cold, brutal side of, of the business. Um, David DeCastro came in in a replacement for a veteran at some point. Uh, Marquise Pouncey replaced a veteran um, before a great 10-year career, and he retired. Uh Villanueva replaced Kelvin Beecham, who was a good veteran, in my opinion, who got hurt. Um, Beecham's still in the league. Uh, Marcus Gilbert was replaced um, by you know a couple different guys before they found the solution that they want. All these guys probably met the end uh, of their their you know serviceability in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But the Steelers would have paid them pretty close to the end of, of the contracts that they signed. So. Um, I think to a fault they might err on the side of this is a guy that we made a commitment to, we want to stay to that, but they're not putting that in stone either. Finally, any uh, player or two that you're looking at for Friday that could enhance their chance of making the team? Um, I would have said Antoine Brooks, to be honest with you. He's he's the guy that I kind of wanted to to see going into camp. Um, I, I like what they're doing with him. I think he's a fun player. Um, good young player, good guy to watch. But dude, Trey Norwood would probably be a good one for me in this game. Um, I just saw something to the effect that, that uh, um, Terrell Austin had said that, that he's in a pretty good position right now to be their backup safety. Um, that's not the impression I think I would have gotten uh, from Norwood to this point in camp. But um, I really like Norwood as far as being a fit for this defense, so right. I wouldn't be surprised 
if they kept him on the active roster, if he could play teams. Um, let's see what he does. You know, that's an important position. You're not exactly sure um, what they would do if Minka Fitzpatrick were to go down. Um, he's going to be a big dollar player. We know that coming up. So they, you know, they might need a, a, a guy on a cheap contract here in, in another two years uh, to replace an All-Pro player. So I, and I, I really like Norwood for what the, the kind of player he is and the kind of coverages the Steelers have been running lately, really under under uh, uh, Terrell Austin. I think he's a great fit, and I definitely think he's a kid that they're going to want to hang on to. I wasn't sure if he was just going to be a practice squad guy this year, though. Right. Um, I thought that the the pursuit angle that he took on the Eagles uh, receiver who took that 70-yard touchdown run, uh, I would have thought that would be enough to, to kind of convince him that Norwood probably shouldn't be on the roster this year. But uh, maybe that doesn't matter. You know, some guys you just have a, a strategic plan for, and uh, they can work him in on, on the 53. Always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for the time. Look forward to talking uh, next week. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Neil Kulong, back with more in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way. The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf online at sunburymotors.com. Ford Lincoln Kia Hyundai. Best in new inventory, great pre-owned inventory. You'll get trade-in numbers, everything. They'll they're, they're going to work with you. They want to make sure you get the best deal possible. You want to know why? Yeah, it's because they're just trying to make a sale. But look, you get repeat business when you're treated well, and they get a lot of repeat business. It's all at Sunbury Motors, Fourth Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf. Online at Sunbury Motors. Dot com. Um, so I want to get very quickly to the Pac-12 expansion story, but then I want to get to something about Tom Coughlin. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, Nicole Auerbach, by the way, outstanding senior writer, in exclusive talk with college football reporters, George Klyovkov, who's the new commissioner of the Pac-12, said the decision by Texas and Oklahoma to leave the Big 12 obviously caused everybody to think about their conference and their membership. Certainly in the Pac-12, we were thinking about that as well, and it caused me to do a lot of work on what would be the reason for expansion. New games, new schools that get to play in our stadiums, new time zones, and new recruiting territories. At least for the scheduling portion of the alliance that was announced this morning, we're able to achieve a lot of what we wanted to achieve when we were thinking about expansion by forming this alliance. So it is widely believed that most or all of the eight remaining Big 12 schools, Baylor, Iowa State, Kansas, Kansas State, Oklahoma State, TCU, Texas Tech, West Virginia, reached out to the Pac-12 shortly after Texas and Oklahoma's decisions. Klyovkov said at last month's Pac-12 media day that we've had significant inbound interest from many schools. We will work with our presidents and chancellors to evaluate these opportunities. We don't think there's any risk, though, at staying at 12 teams. They're going to announce by the end of the week where they stand. The Pac-12 does on expansion. They'll do it by the end of the week. Now I want to get to this story, and this story is... Gut wrenching, 
And it's the same time, it is a story that many, many, many people in our area can relate to. Tom Coughlin put together a fabulous coaching career. Waterloo High School, okay, and I know about Waterloo High School because that's where my grandparents lived for years, and my uh, my cousin Karen's uh, husband Mike knows uh, Tom Coughlin very well. Eventually, he got to Boston College, where he did really, really well, and then, of course, the Jacksonville Jaguars and two Super Bowl championships with the New York Giants. And remember, when it comes to what he did at Jacksonville, he got Jacksonville to the AFC Championship game his second year, but, you know, two Super Bowl titles with the Giants. But now this. Coughlin's beloved wife, Judy, is battling an incurable brain disorder. Uh, The original article took place, uh, was put together by the New York Times. But these days, Tom Coughlin finds himself in the role of caretaker. Judy Coughlin, to whom the head football, the former head coach, has been married to for 54 years, was diagnosed with progressive, uh, with a progressive uh, brain disorder, a palsy in 2020. It's incurable. He revealed in a deeply personal and moving essay that appeared in the New York Times. So many of you are gearing up for another NFL season. I'll be sitting far from the sidelines at the bedside, holding the hand of my biggest supporter, my beloved wife, the mother of our children, and grandmother to our grandchildren, Coughlin wrote. And by the way, the Coughlins have four children and 11 grandchildren. Coughlin's decision to put aside his interests, to care for his wife, encapsulates the lessons he tried to instill in his players at the college and NFL levels about responsibility, sacrifice, and accountability. I'm not seeking sympathy. It's the last thing I want. It's the last thing that most caregivers want. Taking care of Judy is a promise I made 54 years ago when she was crazy enough to say I do. Coughlin admitted to becoming a full-time caregiver of a loved one isn't easy given the unpredictability that comes with the territory. Judy's decline has been nothing but gut-wrenching and has placed me in a club with tens of millions of other Americans who serve as a primary caregiver for a loved one. And to all of you, so many of you, up and down the listening area, east and west, north and south in the listening area, so many of you are walking in the same shoes as Tom Coughlin. Admittedly transitioning from being an NFL franchise coach and manager to a full-time caregiver was not easy. It's still not easy. The playbook is either changing by the minute or so numbingly repetitious you lose track of time and yourself. Along the way, some people perceived that he had draconian methods of discipline and accountability. But Coughlin's intent was always pure from the get-go, and to this day, many of his former players have spoken glowingly about how the old coaches, the old school coaches of ways have helped them grow into responsible husbands and fathers. It's what you hear today from the players who played for Joe Paterno. And Joe, by the way, oh, thought so highly of Tom Coughlin. Remember when Coughlin came here for Scouting, He wanted me to go get Coughlin and bring him up to the office. He says, Steve, you know Tom Coughlin. I said, yes, I know who he is. He says, yes. Yeah. He says, Steve, get him, bring him upstairs. I said, sure. I do want the players I coached in college in the NFL who thought all my crazy ideas about discipline, commitment, and accountability ended when they left the field to know that it is not the case. The truth is, is that when those qualities matter most, is now. Our friend said we don't get to choose our sunset, and that's true. But I am so blessed to get to hold Judy's hand through hers. 
Coughlin, who founded the Tom Coughlin J Fund with his family to provide financial and emotional support to families with children diagnosed with cancer, has seen that struggle up close through the families the organization has helped through the years. As Coughlin now faces his own gut-wrenching battle of watching their matriarch battle a disease with no known cure, the former head coach is intent on making whatever time Judy has left as memorable as he can. I've learned firsthand caregiving is all-consuming. It is mentally and physically exhausting. I've spent my entire life preparing for some of the biggest games a person could play, but nothing can prepare you to be a caregiver who has to watch a loved one slip away. There are many of you I am talking to right now that know firsthand exactly what he is talking about. There are many of you right now I am talking to that may know secondhand or maybe in a 1A, your mother may be taking care of your father or your father may be taking care of your mother. You know what I speak of. My mother passed away nine years ago, almost nine years ago. My father passed away 15 years ago. My father, for whatever reason, showed signs of Alzheimer's at the age of 59. Now, he worked until he was 65, or excuse me, he worked until he was 64. And my mother kept him at home as long as she could. My mom probably kept my dad home probably two years longer than maybe he should have. And I mean for her health. But she did so out of absolute and complete love. And my mother was, in a time where we heard, hear the word hero used all the time, hero this and hero that, caregivers are heroic in the truest definition of the word. My mom was heroic. She wouldn't think, she would never have thought that way, but she was. And because of that, I understand what Tom Coughlin's talking about. Because of what Tom Coughlin's talking about, many of you understand, unfortunately, what he's talking about. So to all the caregivers out there, you're heroes. You're going through something that on a daily basis you never know what you're going to face. But because you love someone so much, you go through every twist, turn, frustration, and you keep doing it and getting up every day and going through it all over again with all the twists and turns and the frustration out of absolute love. You're heroes. You're a hero to the person that needs you. And I saw this story today, and of course, I thought about obviously in my lifetime what you know what my mom went through with my dad. But I thought about all of you who have gone through very much the same thing. Just you know, I'm able to personalize the story and talk about my parents and my mom and with my dad, which allows me to tell the story better. But it's a story many of you out there can absolutely relate to. And just remember to all the caregivers out there, to the person that you're giving care to, you are the definition of a hero. And me saying it doesn't make it any easier, but it's true. Back with more in a moment. Great to have you with us today on News Radio 1070 WK. It's about trust. It's about we've looked each other in the eye. We've made an agreement. We have great confidence and faith. Our board chairs have looked each other in the eye and have committed to the same level of support and connection to one another. Our athletics directors have done that. And so if that's what it takes to get something considerable done, then, you know, we've, we've lost our way. Well, 
I, I think the primary purpose of this, at least initially, is how to deal with the college football playoff. I think the scheduling component comes in later. You know, agreements that they'll have. Uh, if the Pac-12 makes the announcement later in the week, which I expect that they're probably not going to do anything in terms of expansion, uh, the Big 12s and those schools, those eight schools, are in deep, deep trouble. I mean, deep, deep trouble. I mean, not, I mean each one, it, it, I'm sure, has been burning the phones trying to find a landing spot. But everything's about value. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Kansas has no value. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Iowa State doesn't have value. I mean, look, everybody has value along the way. Um, But there's a marketplace value. And the marketplace value, I'm talking about marketplace of West Virginia, Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, TCU, Texas Tech, and Baylor is is it doesn't move the needle value wise on expansion. Now, could West Virginia fit nicely in the ACC? Probably. Could Oklahoma State and somebody else, let's say Texas Tech, fit into the or TCU fit into the Pac-12 to give them a um, a footprint in Oklahoma and Texas? Sure, it could. But there really isn't anybody that fits that changes the value, for example, of the Big Ten. It just doesn't. You have a new TV contract coming up, which is still the single most important element. I mean, Kevin Warren can take all the time he wants on alliances and things like that. The TV contract is still the single most important element that his office needs to take care of over the next 12 months. Somewhere in that that time frame, in the next 12 months, the single most important element. It's not expansion. It's not alliances. All that stuff's fine. And it's not, you know, the college football playoff is part of it. But it's that TV contract. What can you do to get the number higher for all of your members moving forward. You have 14 of them counting on your office to hit a home run again. And you're the first one up in the negotiating cycle for college sports. That's the first one up. Second one up is the Pac-12, believe it or not. Third one up is the Big 12. And then it's not until you get to the 2030s where the fourth one up is to get, believe it or not, the SEC. The ACC is last. They're the last in the bidding group. So I, every time I hear somebody say, go to the ACC, get rid of the Big Ten, I look at, go, I, I look at these people like, do you know what the numbers say? If they were close, we could talk about it, but they're not even close. Is a $25 million per school gap between the Big Ten and the ACC. That's gigantic. That's a chasm. And that number for the ACC barely goes up for the next 15 years. The single most important thing the Big Ten office can do right now is not alliances, not college football playoff, but get the next TV contract negotiated with the various partners they have to do. College football playoff is second. The alliance is last. And when it comes to this 17-game, oh, if I hear one more time about the 17-game thing, it's okay for high schools to play 16. That's Okay. That's all right. I never hear anybody talk about that. I never hear anybody talk about teams playing 16. You're talking about two teams that might maybe play 17. Maybe. The vast majority of the time, it's going to be 16. Same as high school. Same as the high school playoff. No different. High school, college, no different. Zero. 
academics, vast majority of the playoff. In fact, all the playoff would be after semesters are over. I know in my I know in my last class is. I know the last class when I teach. And if the college football playoff began the next weekend, it would be during semester break. Now, not everybody's on the same calendar. But the 12-team playoff is important to spread college football all out across the country. It is important that you get more teams in there. And, of course, number three, most of all, after coming through a pandemic where everybody suffered significant losses, it's a way to get cash back into the coffers. Not for football. Not for basketball. Remember, where does the cash go? This is the big mistake that they make in every trial. And Mark Emmert is the leader of the pack when it comes to making this gigantic mistake. Tell everybody where the money goes. Tell them it goes into men's soccer. Tell them that money goes into softball. Tell them that money goes into gymnastics. It doesn't just sit there and build another football building. No. That's not where the money goes. The money is spread out across the landscape. That's where the money goes. And they never explain that. Never. They keep talking about their academic mission. Just tell them where the money goes, will you? Tell everybody if you believe in Title IX. If you are running through the wall for Title IX, guess what Title IX needs to be successful? Cash. We live in a world where my biggest concern is always and will always continue to be a major concern about a lack of common sense. Great to have you with us today. More fun coming up tomorrow. Matt will, Matt's team is already an underdog to the Jets. It's just... (laughs) I have no words. Speaks for itself. Still no contract. 